I'm just going to get rid of the display mode here. Yep, go away. There we go. And we're going to zoom out a little bit. Somebody asked me a couple of days ago just how big these ships are. Uh, right now my grid size, as you can see down here in the corner, it's set to uh, 10 meters. So each one of these little grids is 10 meters. I'm going to just zoom the grid out a little bit. So that's a 5 meter grid. Sorry, let's go the other way. Um, we're going to expand the grid. So it's at 500 meters. Now let's zoom in a little bit. So we're back to where we're supposed to be. So each one of these squares now, one, two, three, uh, just under four. So let's uh, call that um, 1.7 uh, kilometers, roughly. That's a pretty big ship. So if you're looking at the show and you're wondering, geez, how big are these ships compared to a Viper? Well, they're pretty massive. Um, the intention behind the show was to make them as big as possible. Uh, but how do you make that? kind of illusion come alive when you're still working in a computer and you have certain limitations. In the previous video I touched on the fact that when the series was originally uh, conceived and the miniseries was produced there was of course no 64-bit computing at the time. Uh, in 2005 of course uh, right at the beginning of season 2 uh, Microsoft came out with XP 64-bit uh, operating systems and we immediately began to switch over from 32-bit XP and go into 64-bit XP and all the systems that had originally 4 gigabytes of RAM with them uh, we can now actually uh, utilize that extra 2 gigabytes of RAM because of the 2 gigabyte or 3 gigabyte limit uh, in XP 32-bit. Uh, these days though it's not uncommon for uh, workstations and visual effects graphics workstations and render nodes to have uh, between 4, 8, sometimes even 16 gigabytes of RAM. And I just recently spoke to somebody who was having uh, debates about whether or not he should spring for a system capable of 32 uh, with an expendable to 64 gigabytes of RAM. That's a little bit more overkill than I think it's necessary. After all, um, in Season 2 uh, and Season 3, we were working with machines of 4 and 8 gigabytes of RAM and we were winning Emmy Awards for it. So really quickly this machine again is a uh, Phenom 2 920 uh, processor running at 2.8 gigahertz uh, it's a quad core so originally on season 3 when we started bringing the shuttles in as an alternative to the Intel uh, machines that we had purchased on season 2 uh, for rendering as well as for our uh, artist workstations those systems back then were only uh, dual cores and they were running around about 2.4 gigahertz so the difference obviously is significant but when you look back uh, we were able to pull off quite a significant amount of work on some very very uh, inexpensive but fast boxes and that's why we went with the shuttles is that they were significantly less expensive than the larger workstations that we were getting uh, previously uh, by a factor of several thousand dollars and they were also smaller we could put one on artist desk and not consume up a lot of office space or desk space and they were also much easier uh, to deploy in the office for rendering because they sucked up a lot less power than the dual Xeon Intel workstations and they rendered as fast or if not more uh, speedy than the Intel boxes. Okay now that we've got the Pegasus loaded in here let's take a look at uh, a few things. Uh, first of all this ship is significantly different design from the Galactica. This is uh, a later uh, Battlestar that would have been built in the most uh, five, ten years previous. The Galactica, if you followed the show, was a 60-year-old uh, uh, Battlestar, uh, or 40-year-old Battlestar, and uh, its design obviously has changed. But like the Galactica, it has a lot of surface object detail, and of course there's more engines to the Pegasus uh, in a lot more detail than uh, you would expect for a ship that only really was in four or five episodes uh, before they blew it up and then uh, brought it back for Razor. Now you can see all the detail that's inside the ship as well. Uh, let's go and turn on a neat little function that came out in Lightwave uh, a few editions ago which is called the headlight and it gives me an OpenGL headlight which is great because this card is obviously able to display all this stuff in OpenGL so now I can actually work with my scene with this little headlight on and I can see it uh, but that little headlight won't actually render in a final render. I've just switched back to the camera view here and I'm going to turn the headlight off 
All right, and I'm going to just take a look at our temp key light. So our key light here is a DP infinite light. If you caught the earlier video today, uh, the DP infinite light is very similar to a light wave distant light, but it gives me the ability to produce soft shadows, uh, whereas the distant light traditionally available in light wave uh, does not. It's a very, very hard, hard edge shadow. Uh, that it casts and there's really no way to make it a soft edge shadow. You could use other lights to do that but that would increase uh, render times and also scene setup sophistication. Um, traditionally when we're working on a show like this we want to keep it as simple as possible uh, with the least amount of uh, increase in render time but that's part of the changes between the technology today and the technology from three years ago is both that the software and the hardware have improved in their speed and Lightwave is no different than that. There's been significant amount of feature improvements and rendering speed improvements that allow us to uh, take on shots like this but use a fairly inexpensive workstation to get it done.